Welcome to Behavioral Grooves. My name is Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. Behavioral Grooves is the podcast where we talk to businesses and nonprofit leaders about how they apply behavioral science to work to make their businesses more effective. We also offer fresh ideas on how behavioral science can improve life at home. It's also the podcast that shares insights from behavioral science researchers from a wide variety of cross-disciplinary fields. And then we discuss how that research gets applied into the real world. Yes, we do. And in this episode, we're sort of mixing both. In this episode, we're initiating our discussions with professors from the Nobeck Workshop at the University of Pennsylvania that we recently attended. And we're starting with Dr. Christina Beaky Airy, the faculty director of the Master of Behavioral and Decision Science programs at UPenn. Christina is another amazing Italian American researcher in the field of behavioral science. Woohoo! <laughs> Shout out to Sylvia Saccato and Francesca Gino, who were also on the show, and great Italian researchers. Yeah. We, we love them. And we got to sit down with Christina in an alcove in the Kislik Center at UPenn in order to discuss this terrific master's degree for practitioners. Christina's program is in its third year with 75 students from 12 different countries. And the emphasis on practitioners and cross-disciplinary work are what make the program unique. Students carry the insights they gain from behavioral science back to the restaurants, small businesses, NGOs, nonprofits, and global corporations where they work. If you're interested, we strongly encourage you to check it out. There are links in the episode notes on how to reach them. We also want to let you know that we did have some recording issues. Wait, we? We? we well, <laughs> I, I wasn't the one who forgot the batteries in the, in the microphone. Okay. I had some recording troubles because I forgot to put new batteries in the wireless microphone. I should have reminded you. It's, it's both of our issues. I just wanted to throw you under the bus there for and a minute. I, oh, I deserve to be. Uh, but that did cause us to lose some of our conversation with Christina. So we did make some edits in order to kind of make that work for you. And we hope that it does work for you. But as a reminder, you might hear some background noise occasionally because we recorded this right on the outskirts of the main gathering area at the conference. And the conversation with Christina was absolutely fantastic. And so we hope that you enjoy it. So with that, please sit back with your favorite social norms beverage. And let's jump right into our conversation with Dr. Christina Bicchieri. And uh, I work in the intersection between uh, behavioral theory, uh, game theory, and, uh, you know, psychology. So That's it's a wonderful intersection, intersection of all these fields, yes. How did you come to that intersection? Uh, it's very interesting. Um, I was born as a philosopher of science who also studied economics. And uh, I got um, very interested uh, at the very beginning of my career, I was studied in Cambridge, in England. I got very interested in decision theory and then game theory and the epistemic foundations. And one of the problems in game theory is there are multiple equilibria. And it's very hard to predict which equilibrium the player will play. And I remember, uh, you know, looking at a small paper by David Krebs, who was a very famous mm -hmm. game theorist. And in this paper he said, oh, you know, the, the, the problem is, is not that great a problem because some equilibria are social norms. Oh, I said, that's interesting. <laughs> and, uh, and from that uh, I went and uh, looked at all the literature I could find of social norms, okay, what they are, and so on and so forth. And there is a lot of literature, of course, in the social sciences, sociology, anthropology, social psychology, etc. The problem for me, um, and I come to uh, my life now, was uh, the definition was not what we call operational. What does it mean? That the concept was not defined well enough to make predictions or explain. How can we say that there is a social norm, how do we measure it? How can we predict that the people will, you know, follow a norm if we cannot measure it, okay? So my work has been dedicated since then to give a very specific, measurable notion of social norm. And this 
is the 2006 books, The Grammar of Society, that a lot of people are quoting. Of course, after I did that work, then uh, I started getting interested in actually using these measures. <laughs> You know, what a great idea. How after, do after you do you that? The book. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I started doing uh, uh, experiments, lab experiments, uh, in which I basically uh, play, change people's expectations, and see, and I come in a second to the definition of expectations, and see if their behavior changes. Why do I talk of expectation? Because social norms are bundles of expectations. Oh. Okay? So, what is a social norm? It's a rule of behavior within a population. It's not usually universal. They are often very local. And within this population, uh, people will have beliefs about other people in the population following these particular rules. They will have, and this is what I call the empirical expectation, is a belief about how people behave. Okay. And, but they also will have a normative expectation, which is a belief about what people in the population approve of or disapprove of, what they think should be done or shouldn't be done. Now, we can have all this, all this sort of expectation, and they have no effect on behavior. This happens. Now, the interesting thing for a social norm, this expectation must have an effect on behavior. If it's to be um, a social norm. Exactly. Yes. So we need both this expectation, but we also need what I call a conditional preference, a preference for following the rule given the existence of these expectations. Wow. This is crucial. Yes. So uh, I started doing experiment, uh, you know, relating to cooperation and fairness, where we, we sort of know what people think, especially in America, but even cross-culturally, you know, it's, uh, it's quite clear. And what I did, uh, I manipulate people's expectation and see, mm, if I change their empirical expectation, will they still behave nicely? Answer, no. <laughs> if I change their normative expectation, will they still behave nicely? Answer, no. So I wanted to prove, to show that uh, behavior, okay, the preference for a type of behavior is conditional on expectations. So if it is conditional expectation, it means if I vary the expectation, behavior will change. And I show that in many experiments I did. Now, UNICEF got really interested in my work. I can understand why. And they said, ah, we never thought uh, uh, that uh, you know, all our policies are aimed at changing behavior, but uh, we never thought about uh, manipulating expectations, about social norms, etc. And so I started doing uh, uh, consulting for UNICEF. And I've done consulting on lots of issues uh, going from child marriage to female genital cutting to uh, child nutrition to violence against women, and finally with the Gates Foundation on uh, open defecation elimination. And in all these cases, I have developed measure of people's beliefs, expectations, and tools to decide whether these expectations have a bite on behavior or not. Right. Okay. So tell us about the, uh, the the work that you're doing in India right now. This this project, yes. this study, sounds fascinating. Yeah. Okay. So one thing that I must premise is that uh, the best technology will not help unless people have a reason to adopt it. Right. Okay. And uh, what gives people a reason to change behavior? Very often, um, international organization have relied on giving people information. So I give you information about how bad open defecation is for your health. I give you information about how fantastic the implementation of this new ABC. technology is. Exactly. Yes. We know that people don't respond at well to information. And so the question is, uh, what will give them a reason to change behavior? And so what we do, we do surveys. I do surveys in which I analyze people's 
expectations about, well, what other people that matter to me, and I come to this point in a moment, are doing or are planning to do, and uh, another kind in the normative expectation, what do these people think should be done? You know, what do these people think uh, I ought to do? Now, who are these people? <laughs> okay, it's not the world. No. But it's what we call the reference network. A so, reference network. Yes. So when I uh, ask, uh, you know, uh, in a village uh, about, you know, what do you think other people are doing or are planning to do, I exactly know who, who these other people are because I do, before this kind of uh, questionnaire, I have an analysis of networks because norms are properties of networks, not the, of individuals. And these, are, and, but these are individual networks. This is my network and your network and Kurt's network. Absolutely, individual network. Usually, in a community. Okay, if we think of uh, uh, open defecation versus uh, using and building toilets, etc the network, we can define very clearly the network. And I tell you something surprising. One obvious, uh, you know, prediction would be, oh, the neighbors matter. Yeah. And what we discover is the neighbors don't matter at all <laughs> unless uh, they are relative or close friends. These are the people who matter when you have to decide to build a toilet, if it's broken, how to repair it, um, if you need to borrow money, whom to ask, and so on and so forth, and with whom you talk about that. So in, okay. in the India component, what you found is that my neighbors don't matter as much as those family, close friends, exactly. regardless of how, as you said, they're small villages. Absolutely. And even if you're living across the street from them, it may not matter. It may not matter. Yes. That is fascinating, well, which is surprising. not what we would have Absolutely, expected. would have expected. So I myself expected, but uh, this is uh, why it's so important to do a network analysis. Yes, exactly, because we cannot talk of norm in general. They are really uh, relative to a reference network, so we have to know the reference network, basically, in order to enact changes. So then, how do you start to enact changes if information is not enough? No, so simply telling people this is not enough. Are you going to rely on the reference networks exclusively uh, absolutely, to get absolutely. the information Absolutely, that's to them? very, very important. Uh, there is another component that I'm very keen about, uh, which is trendsetters. In every community I have studied, not only about open defecation, but, you know, uh, violence, uh, uh, feeding children and whatnot, there are some people who seem to be more dedicated to change, more convinced that uh, things should, uh, should be better in a different way. And uh, the interesting thing is, uh, what are the characteristics of these trendsetters? Okay. And uh, I just published uh, on, uh, you know, Wharton has uh, uh, a little uh, uh, website journal and I published uh, 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 the result, basically, of the study that I've been doing in India for the government and UNICEF on the following thing. Uh, in India, the government enacted a program called Swatch Bharat. And the program wants, basically, to change the face of sanitation in India. You okay. know, say, Everybody will have, every family will have a toilet and will use it and keep it functional and so on and so on. And the interesting thing, the, 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 the project has been relatively successful. If you think that India is an enormous continent, you know, it's very hard to change and change it quickly, but it has been, again, not completely, but relatively successful. And the interesting thing is, how was it coordinated from the president down to the villages. Yeah. Because you need a lot of coordination and a lot of cooperation. And in my view, trendsetters at every level have induced, basically, change. And so I studied the properties of these trendsetters, 
And I try, when we do something new, to identify them within a community. Okay. And one analysis I have done is uh, there will be trendsetters that initiate something completely new, and there will be trendsetters that will initiate abandonment of a norm which may be bad, like female genital cutting okay. or violence against women versus, uh, you know, using toilet, uh, you know, starts... Uh, start something you know, versus uh, stopping something. Exactly. When you start something, it's good if you are at the center of a network because there are a lot of people observing you. People generally trust you. You know, you have to be trusted. To be at the center of a network, usually you are. And uh, therefore, you have a lot of leverage. So it comes back to my personal... Uh, yes component yes. of potentially having a negative impact Absolutely. of changing Absolutely. that, that Absolutely. norm. Absolutely. And the, and the second issue, when you are at the center of the network, uh, probably you have a certain power, mm -hmm. but uh, power is a two-edged sword. <laughs> if you start doing th something that, you know, goes against what people firmly believe or follow, they may not trust you anymore. So it's very delicate to change a bad norm when you start from the center of the neck. So if you're in the center and you change wow. a norm, wow. you might actually lose that center of power because Absolutely. you are no longer being the trust. There that is, is the risk. risk. So yeah. it's less likely that you're going to do that. Yes. But if you're on the peripheral, you already, you're already you not in that center of power. Absolutely. It's easier for you it's to do it. It's easier for you to do it. Yeah. So... Uh, so uh, also, I'm taking away that uh, the, the person who is promoting uh, the, the new norm versus the person who is demoting yeah. the exactly. old norm, right? Exactly. These, these need exactly. to be d different, different, uh, different type of network positions. Different network positions. Yes. Okay. And uh, also probably, maybe probably different, different types people. of people. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Typically, people infer, oh, most people approve of X. Most people think that X should be done. Okay. Now, of course, if I tell you uh, most people wear shoes, <laughs> yes. you know, that's less relevant. But if I tell you, you know, most people do not accept a bribe. Right. What do you infer? Well, that most people disagree with bribing, think bribing is not acceptable. Okay. If instead I tell you, oh, most people think bribing is not acceptable, do you infer that they do not give or take bribes? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. So there is an asymmetry yeah. in the inference we draw from the empirical to the normative. Now, why do I think this is important? Because when we do nudging, norm nudging, nudging and so on are, are one of our favorite terms. Okay, we give information about other people, and the information may be empirical, what other people do, or normative. You know give a normative message. Now, what uh, I am warning people is uh, pay attention to the message you choose. Because if you just give a moralizing message, a normative message, people may completely discount it. Okay? May not infer that, oh yes, people then do that. Not at all. When you give an empirical message, you have to pay attention to something different. That is, if uh, Let's say in Italy, if uh, I give you the message, 99% of people pay their taxes, are you going to believe that? No. <laughs> oh, well, well. <laughs> because it's, it's false. Uh, yeah, well, it, oh, it, okay. feels, it feels it's a little false. high. If it yes. were 75% or 65%, then I might be willing exactly. to believe it more. So, uh, or in a country where there is a, a lot of bribing and it is quite endemic, you know, letting people know how many people bribe, you say, is a really high bribing, uh, this induces people to bribe more. Right. Because they start thinking is acceptable. It's the, it's the norm. <laughs> it's the <a> norm, <laughs> exactly. So you have to pay a lot of attention when you give an empirical message, what sort of message you give. Mm -hmm. Well, and does it have to relate back to that referential network? To, to, to be uh, relevant as well? Absolutely, absolutely. And now you have to decide what the reference network is. Right. But, uh, you know, if we are in Nigeria, I'm doing a study of corruption in Nigeria. Okay. okay? If we are in Nigeria and, uh, uh, you know, we start sending the message that uh, most people give, uh, you know, bribe the police, uh, which is the case. Okay. Okay. 
uh, what am I doing? Well, I am almost in using more driving. Yes. So yeah. I have to pay attention. The problem is uh, there are situations, and who's the reference network is people like me living in Nigeria who drive a car, who have a high chance of meeting a policeman or woman that will ask for a bribe. Okay. So uh, what's going to happen in a situation where the majority behavior is negative? Okay. You cannot cheat. Uh, you cannot tell. No, the majority behavior is positive because people know that. Because they will realize yeah, the 99% realize of that people who pay you. taxes, that's exactly. not true. I don't believe you. Exactly. You cannot, uh, it's not that effective to give a moralizing message. Mm -hmm. So saying, oh, you shouldn't, uh, you know, pay bribes because, etc. People say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, most people do that. So the only alternative that I see, and I'm looking at that, uh, uh, especially in Nigeria, is try to isolate some situations in which indeed the people behave in a positive pro-social way, but show that there is an advantage to do that. What do you mean by advantage? An economic advantage, okay. a reputation advantage, you know, and not a moral advantage because people may not care that much about their moral superiority, let's okay. say, but they do care about uh, different type of incentives. Mm -hmm. Listen today. And uh, some incentive can be just monetary incentives, you know, oh, this community does better economically, but they can also be a reputation that is, uh, oh, if people know that I behave in such a way, they want to do more business with me. They want to have more relationship with me, etc., etc. So we have to stress the positive incentive that are related to, you know, being, uh, though it's a small group, it's a positive small group. And by Focusing on that small referential group in yes. that context, right? Then you can start driving change uh, across a, a absolutely, a, absolutely. At least that context, and maybe even expanding absolutely. it larger. I tell you something else. Uh, I am a big supporter of soap operas. Soap operas, <laughs> absolutely. Okay. Why? Why? Uh, uh, we have a lot of data. Also, economists have studied that, and uh, they show important demographic changes. Um, you know, uh, following uh, very successful soap operas. Now, soap operas may present characters that play the role of trendsetters. Ah. So, in my book, uh, Norms in the Wild, the last chapter is called Trendsetters. And uh, uh, part of this chapter, I talk about soap operas because sometimes intervention that we do in villages you know, are not scalable. Yes. You have to scale up intervention. And how do we scale them up? Well, with the media. Your media are important. But what is important, there are lots of studies that show that people, especially long term soap opera, tend to identify with the characters. Yes. And so. Good and bad. Uh, good and bad, absolutely. Good and bad, <laughs> yes. And uh, the idea is edutainment, the old policy of edutainment, which is soap operas that should educate people, uh, you know, in some way to behave better. For example, think of uh, toilets. So let's think we have a very successful soap opera where people don't talk about toilets at all, but go to the toilet on and off. You know, they go to the toilet. So it's a normal thing to do. And they have a toilet. Okay. So they're... So a character which is uh, uh, highly respected, a coveted model, uses a toilet. Okay? The important thing is this character have to be people you can identify with. Right. So at your level, basically, age-wise, demographically-wise, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there are lots of extremely good example of scaling up certain intervention through soap opera. It's interesting. We did an interview with a gentleman, uh, Rob Burnett, and uh, he's the leader of A Well-Told Story, which is a, a nonprofit in Kenya. Uh, they didn't use soap operas, but he had a comic book um, where the main instigator of the comic or the main character in the comic book was a recently graduated, um, unemployed, high school, you know, couldn't get a job, but he runs a, a uh, pirate DJ FM radio station. So again, relatable to the uh, group that he was targeting. Exactly. And and they 
focused in on having these descriptive, you know, these norms that they were doing, like how to, you know, having safe sex, having, Absolutely. you know, components around business acumen and how do you go about doing that? And, and it's been very, very effective. Absolutely. And this is, uh, you know, what I'm talking uh, uh, about with the Gates Foundation, UNICEF, etc. I say, well, let's work. Uh, uh, the, the best people doing this thing are BBC Media. BBC Media has an enormous uh, experience and tradition of doing this kind of stuff. And the idea is that let's do uh, you know, let's scale up this intervention using the media because this character can be transactor, can show you, oh, this can be done. This guy will go, or girl, will go through a lot of hurdles like a normal girl would do. But they, they triumph in the end. Mm. Okay. <laughs> they triumph crucial. in the end. Yes, that's, <laughs> that's fantastic. All right. Well, Christina, we are here at the Norms and Behavior Change at the University of Penn, its conference. Um, so tell us a little bit about this conference, because I know you were instrumental in putting it together and what you're trying to achieve here. I'm trying uh, to achieve a great cross-disciplinary discussion about norms and behavioral change. And, uh, you know, economists are now behavioral economists, are doing a lot of experiments on you know, behavioral change, they got very interested in norms, but sociologists, anthropologists, uh, social psychologists have been interested in norms for a long, long time. And so what I'm trying uh, to do is uh, sort of build bridges between disciplines uh, and across disciplines. And you see that in some of the papers that are presented. Yeah. You know, for example, today we have this paper that uses Alan Fiske, yeah. uh, you know, idea of scripts, etc. And I myself, in my 2006 book, actually use Alan Fiske uh, because I think norms are part of scripts. Yeah. And uh, every society has a certain number of scripts, ways that we have to interpret reality. Yeah, the different scripts are based upon uh, absolutely these components. Different. Yes, yes. So a market script. Uh, if I start uh, showing an interaction which exchange money, typically is a market script. Typically, we have certain expectation about each other. Yeah, and we know from experiments uh, the same experiment with the same amount of money pay off. If you present it as a market interaction, people will do one thing. If you present it as a cooperative endeavor, people will do different things. So the script is different, the amount of money and the actions that you can choose are the same, you will behave differently. So so bringing in these different disciplinary components, the, the economics along with the social, uh, the anthropology, psychology, and, psychology so yes. and getting the cross-pollination between yes. the two. And I saw this morning, even the questions that came out, we had, there was a political component who asked a very insightful question to an economist who Absolutely. was talking Absolutely. and very different in, in perspective of how things get and, uh, and interpreted. And I think, unfortunately, there isn't enough cross-pollination, <laughs> uh, you know, among disciplines. And this is particularly relevant, not just theoretically, which is already an interesting point, but uh, from the viewpoint of uh, public policy intervention. And why isn't there more of this sort of uh, intersectionality, sort of this, this cross-disciplinary work? Well, uh, one reason is uh, that uh, when you study economics or when you study political science, uh, there are tracks that are not particularly interdisciplinary. So the, the way the disciplines are set up, okay, are quite separate from each other. So you have to make an effort to bring them together. And second, there are some costs. You know, uh, basically <laughs> human capital cost because you have to learn something about another discipline and this costs time, basically. So that there are some costs, but the benefits, I think, are enormous. Yet there's all sorts of research that supports the idea that this kind of interdisciplinary work yields better results. 
Absolutely. And uh, Absolutely. and is is your program here at the University of Pennsylvania intending to uh, obviously you're very intentional with bringing this to the students uh, as well as the academic community is the hope that the students will actually go out and in their application be more interdisciplinary? Absolutely. Um, you know, you may know that I started this master in uh, behavioral decision science at Penn, which is getting really very successful. Uh, evidently, there was a need for that. <laughs> and, Obviously. Uh, and it's not like the typical master's MBAs in uh, business schools. Why? Because uh, there is a lot of interdisciplinary work. We push very much applications. Okay. And, uh, uh, for example, at the end of the course, uh, there is a so-called capstone experience where students can do either research with a professor, with a faculty, but most of the students uh, do internships with, uh, it could be UNICEF, it could be the Gate Foundation, it could be Microsoft, uh, it, it, it might be in, in their corporate world uh, they, as well, they right? They come from corporate world. They go back to corporate world and try to put into practice on a specific piece of research or problem they have, what they have learned. And that's why I think it's very successful. So within the cohort, who, who are the people that are joining this new master's? Because uh, we heard from Chris Naves yes. that... You have some really interesting folks. We have very interesting people. Uh, many of them now come from industry, okay. from companies, uh, uh, consulting, but uh, uh, I would say the majority uh, okay. come from uh, uh, the business world. But, uh, you know, also some come from uh, university programs. Okay. Okay. Uh, some may want to go and do a PhD, and they always have questions. Well, I want to do an interdisciplinary PhD. How do I do that? <laughs> you know, and there are lots of barriers to that. Uh, but apart from that, uh, uh, I would say that a lot of people come from industry or want to go into industry and consulting. And also because I was very surprised to discover that, at least in the United States, but also in parts of Europe, every company seems to have now a behavioral unit. Yes. And yes. Many. Many more in Europe. Uh, yes, in Europe also governments are very keen on that, and even local governments are yes. very keen on that. And uh, this is very interesting because, for example, we've been trying to help uh, the Philadelphia government okay. with problems they had uh, about recycling or where to put garbage and so on and so forth. Or also, uh, is is incredible in Philadelphia when there is a heat wave, a lot of people die. Oh, a heat wave. Yes. And again, mm -hmm. there's some behavioral uh, there interventions. There is a, uh, behavioral interventions. And what they did up to now was to give information to older people, especially that are the most vulnerable, about, oh, there are cooling places. You can go to the library. You can go to the church. But people don't do that. Right. And so the question is, how do you change this behavior? Yeah. Okay. So we're working on all these kind of very interesting uh, problems, uh, you know, in which you save lives in this case. Well, and that's, a, a, again, your work in India, you know, all right. the stuff with UNICEF, that's what behavioral science and that component of looking at this from a different angle can really do. It's not about giving people information. It's about <laughs> looking at how do we change their behavior because we're human. And, and as humans, we don't always act in based on information. We don't um, always act in sometimes even in our best interest. Uh, most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> most of the time we don't. <laughs> so, yes. Very true. Well, Christina, I don't know if you know this, but one of the things that we do at the end of these sessions, and usually it's Tim that's driving this, is we ask about music because our name is Behavioral Grooves and we had, a, we had a thing about music at the beginning. So what type of music do you tend to listen to and do you listen to music when you're working or or do you need it silent when you're working well it depends uh, on the type of work uh if it is uh, a little boring i will listen to music <laughs> <laughs> if i have to be super concentrated i want and there are two type of musics i like uh, i like uh, classical music okay i like mozart i like opera a lot 
Uh, well, coming from Italy, yes, I, I, I adore this, opera. The, the best adore, opera ever created is Italian opera. I adore Verdi in particular. Well, and, and very good. You so should. I, I love that. But I also love uh, like hard rock. Okay. Can you give us an example? Well, uh, uh, you know, the U2 yeah. or, uh, you know, I, I love Bruce Springsteen, I confess. <laughs> <laughs> And, confession, uh, confession. Confession. <laughs> yes, it is. This we is. We found it out here. We did. <laughs> we have. We have a confession. I love it. But uh, okay. So, what about in the times when the the work is boring and you want to? Do you, are you looking to stimulate your your emotions and your brain with a particular type of, of music when when the the task is boring or or uh, routine? Uh, more than stimulating the mind, I want to relax. Okay. Because uh, uh, when something is boring, I get irritated. <laughs> ah, <laughs> and you, you, you and George Lowenstein. Oh, George, George, is George the, says the same thing. That's interesting. George on, on this. Yeah. Yeah. Boredom is irritating for him. Uh, absolutely, yeah. for me too. And therefore, I have to listen to something soothing because I get very irritated by give, a boring Can you give task. us an example? Uh, what well, you would Mozart. Listen? Oh, you would go back oh, to Mozart. Go to yeah. Mozart, yeah. yes, yeah. or yeah. some other uh, classical. It's very soothing for me. That's terrific. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time and being on the Behavioral Groups podcast with us today. Thank you to you both. Thank you. It was very pleasant. Bye. Oh, my God. <laughs> that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I groove on what we learned from our behavioral groups interview, have a free flowing discussion, and whatever else comes into our socialized brains. Yeah, social. We are very socialized, aren't we? We are. I mean, social yeah. norms they they drive our behaviors, they drive our attitudes, they drive what we drink, what we drive, you know, who we hang out with. So they do a lot. So if that's the case, why are we hanging out? Because we're social pariahs, and else we're us. the only two that will be talking to each other here. No, so, no, that is not the case. We are a part of this behavioral science community, and this is our social reference network that we have. Oh, you're you're just popping on all cylinders here. Okay, so popping, <laughs> so like what popcorn? So what that was, you have in a social situation? Oh, sorry. <laughs> So what was it that struck you most about, about our discussion with Christina? All right. So I loved the idea that social norms are really just bundles of expectations. Oh, you were the one who so pointed good. this out to me that but, she said this, and it was it's fascinating. Great. Yeah. And the piece that got me, right, the, the piece that got me is it's not – so those those expectations – have to have some impact on our behavior. Otherwise, they don't fit into the definition oh, right. of a social norm. So you can have an expectation around social elements, but if it doesn't impact how we behave... It, it, it won't become a social norm. It's not really a social norm then. Yeah. So, yeah, and she went on to say that uh, we can, with these expectations, if they really are you know, impacting behavior, we can change the expectations in order to change behavior. Ah, that again. Wow. That's well, like a big wow, isn't it? And, and so when we think about trying to drive scalable social change, mm -hmm. so those types of changes that are in the public good, various different things, we talk about using nudges for that. We talk about a number of other, you know, incentivized, you know, wet ways to change that behavior on a large scale. Social norms might have a bigger impact on some of those behaviors than I had ever anticipated before. Certainly within corporations, my gosh, we all, we, you know, how many times do you hear that? Well, that's the way we do things around here. The culture aspect, which relates back to the social norms of the organization. Of the organization itself, right? Exactly. Yeah, so we're, we're oftentimes in this game of, of relying on someone telling us, no, 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 this is the way we do things. Mm. You know, this is the expectation that we have. And then that 
that, that literally influences our behavior and how we go to the meeting, how we, how we show up. Like, is it socially acceptable to show up late for a meeting or not? You know, things like that become part of the, the culture. So if social norms are driving those behaviors and they're these, the set of expectations, these bundles of expectations that people have, how do we shift those expectations? How do we shift the social norms to change, to ultimately change that behavior? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is, it's complex, right? Because there's a lot of there's a lot of things that are influencing those expectations, and I think that's what Christina is saying. Well, then actually, maybe that does get to things like trendsetters. That okay. could actually, we could talk about trendsetters because that's another really cool part of Christina's uh, commentary is that trendsetters do have the ability to influence us, and so they are coming in uh, against maybe what the current social norm is or offering a different viewpoint on that and making that viewpoint become the dominant one? Is that what was it? Well, it's, it's, big, it's big enough to influence the behavior to influence the social norms. Okay. I, I think the U.S. president right now is, is a trendsetter because he is influencing our expectations and impacting what the social norms are. So talking about um, Mr. President Donald Trump, not Mr. President Donald president, Trump. Yeah. And the so what you're saying is the expectations that we have about how somebody acts within the presidency is that where you're going with this? Yeah. So I think he's breaking down traditional expectations about what that role is like, uh, what what that role should and shouldn't do. Again, the expectations leading to specific behaviors in in what that role should be or shouldn't be about. And and he's he's defined those. He's he's trend setting new ways of thinking about the presidency. And so you get whether we like it or not. Well, and that's the part where I was going to go right because you get a certain percentage of the population who are going along with that and 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 loving it, loving it. Yeah, right. Coming off and saying this is fantastic, and you get another percentage of the population who are saying, no, this is not the way that we run the presidency. This is not how we have ever done this. Yeah. And they want to push back. And then I think there's a certain percentage of the population that just sits down and watches the, you know, the Simpsons on <laughs> television. Right. And Thank God for the Simpsons. There you go. There you go. So, so how does that work then? Is that a social norm for a certain percentage of the population and others not? And do social norms work in in cultures uh, and pockets within a nation or a culture or various different aspects? That's a good question. I, I think about Silky Britton talked about her work in in the way 80% of the communication within a company comes from about 3% it flows through 3% of the people, right? They're the influencers. Those are right. the ones They're who, like the trendsetters, right? They are They are the trendsetters. So they are the ones who, if you can get them on board with your program or your change initiative, you are much more likely to get the entire organization to go because they have that much sway. So, so what makes a trendsetter? What makes a trendsetter? The trendsetter can come in from the from sort of this outside perspective and uh, actually bring a, a, a new perspective in in a way that other people are attracted to it. You know, celebrities make for great trendsetters. Okay, you, you know, they're great social influencers. The kind of clothes that celebrities have worn for a long time have influenced trends in fashion. Yeah, uh, right. You know, so that that those things have been who, you know, when, when showing a celebrity driving a particular automobile influence it positively influences the sale of those. So we like to follow those people who we think are attractive, wealthy, powerful, those those kinds of things, I think, are, are the most common trendsetters. So we're reading this book, Messengers, right now that we are going to be interviewing the, the authors for. It, yeah, and, Steve and, Martin and, and Joe Marks. Yeah, right. And to that degree, that's what they're talking about, right? It's about that messenger and why why certain people can influence others, whereas somebody else said the exact same thing, right? And they don't, yeah. right? And so it's some of those those actually fall into this trendsetter type of approach. That yeah, have you ever seen this on Twitter where someone posted something that was really uh, kind of gripped you and it's like, oh, that's a really insightful comment, and they had you know two hundred and fifty followers, and it was just like, yeah, I got three likes. Yeah, that's the stuff that you do all the time. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I'm serious. And, and like how fascinating it is. You do great stuff out on Twitter. But I don't have 180,000 followers. And so when, when someone else posts it who has 180,000, this very same thing, then they get tens of thousands of likes and it becomes like, oh, that's a meme and that's trending. And it's like, damn it. We had that idea. <laughs> we had that idea yeah. first. Yeah. Oh. oh, okay. Is, is is there anything else that uh, that we want to talk about with uh, with Christina? I was fascinated with reference networks. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and again, going back to our presidential component, the reference network for part of the population of the U.S. Uh, do they fall into a different reference network with the president than, say, another portion? Who they're allowing influencing them, basically. Yeah, yeah the, the kinds of sources of information. And because Christina talked about in her, in her studies, she was looking at the way families, uh, it, you know, one household in a small village, really their reference network is... Uh, deeply informed by their family and friends. Even the, the the neighbors, if they're not close friends with them, might not be part of their reference network. And so, are you asking the question if um, that my part of my reference network might be the news agency that I'm getting my news from? Might be the brand that I'm getting my news from? Oh. Could that be part of my nef- reference network? See, that's the piece that is fascinating to me because the reference network, what. You know, I had the assumption, right, that in those villages that the neighbors would be part of that reference network. And what Christina found was that wasn't the case in that situation. However, I, I have to believe, and I'm not a not well-versed on this, that reference networks don't always have to be friends and family. They can be, again, trendsetters that are famous in various different pieces. Yeah, They can be the neighbors that you are you know, trying to impress by buying the fancy new car or whatever it would be. And potentially the reference network could be that media channel. It's signaling Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that I listen to CNN or I listen to Fox or I listen to MSNBC and that can thus influence what my perception is on the world and thus my behavior. Yeah. That's fascinating. I hadn't thought about that. I really wonder is. if Christina has. We should. Well, we should get her back on and we should talk about this. We should this. ask her about that. Yeah. So Ab- cool. Absolutely. So speaking of reference networks, I want to morph this into the music question. Of course you, you do. <laughs> so, so, what, were you anticipating this? I was. I am sorry to say, but it has become a routine. <laughs> I want to morph this into the into your reference networks and how, in the kind of music that you listen to, mm. how much of the music that you... I'm thinking historically because I'm going back to the research that says that 11 to 16 range is supposed to be the most influential part of our time when it comes to listening to music. Which we already disproved for me. For and, you. And that whole component. Yes. But yes, okay. that's a but, prior episode for all of our listeners. I don't right. know, remember which one. But, but let's let's take college when you believe is your most influential period. Were, yeah. there, what, were there reference networks that were informing you and influencing you about the kind of music that you listen to? No, oh, Definitely. Uh, there, I hung out with people uh, who had that musical taste. I had, for for instance, my roommate when I was a junior in college. Uh, he was a sophomore, but he was into all of that that type of music and and introduced me to many of that that type of. In, in, music Richie Palumbo right he you know Richie good guy from Chicago and he had all the insights and knew some band members that they stayed at our house of a uh, uh um, oh my gosh I'm drawing a blank on the band anyway that was but was he a trendsetter do you think he would was, you would he, you consider him a trendsetter or he, just part of your reference network I think he could have been a little bit of both so you know but there were people that I uh had definitely that referential kind of network that I looked up to, yeah. to, to say, Hey, what are they listening to? And to that degree, the radio station that I listened to, yeah. which is, which, which was curating music for curating you, curating music that I said, I'm listening to this radio station, not that radio station, because that radio station plays seventies music, which <laughs> who would ever listen to that stuff? 
<laughs> oh my gosh, that's old and boring. And anything. that's where classic rock came from, dude. Classic. <laughs> There's a the reason it's called classic. Yeah, yeah classic, <laughs> like an old and boring and not new and new wave. And, and yeah, but right. were you signaling with that? Was there a, a signaling function that was I going think on there? there? Was some signaling. There, so yeah. well, so what about you? What about your reference network for your musical? Uh, I was definitely influenced by uh, by the people that were around me that I had access to uh, musically. The, the the early people who helped me learn how to play guitar, for instance, were deeply influential on who I listened to. Mm. So uh, sure, I had the radio, but then if if I was playing with a bunch of guys and they would say, "Hey, did you hear this?" Well, they were already part of this inner reference circle. They were part of this reference network. They were people that I revered, and so I would definitely take their um, their you know recommendations. You okay. know? I, I got deeper into bands like Chicago or the band, for instance. You know Bob Dylan's you know group because of uh, because of those people saying you should you should dive deeper into this. Chicago Transit Authority's first record was really really good. All I, all I really listened to was Saturday in the Park, and I was like, I oh. was gonna say like, you you just blew my mind oh, with right. Chicago because I think of Chicago as a an silly 80s band pop. Band that was light and you're thinking fluffy. The, you're and, thinking the Peter Cetera dominated era, but before that, it was Robert Lamb and Terry Kath, and they were amazing pioneers. and And it was a blues rock band. In what the, the hell days. happened? Peter Cetera wrote more hits, so they followed him, and he's they a great singer. The money. Well, yes, as as most as most bands do. Okay. Yeah. Same thing with with Sticks, right? Same same story there. So. Yeah, you think you think sticks? So Tommy Shaw, yeah, uh, Dennis DeYoung, yep, yep. And Dennis DeYoung, and do you think that that changed? Yeah, Journey? there was. Yeah, uh, I don't know about Journey so much. Th- that could be. Well, but Steve Perry kind of took over at the end. Well, and, he really and, did. That's and true. At the beginning, that was he was more almost. I wouldn't say backup singer, but. He it was almost always co. Right. Know? Well, it, it, that's true. You know, the early versions of the of, of the of the band were absolutely influenced by the keyboardist. Uh, I can't remember their names. Yeah. I know I'm drawing a blank. Uh, uh, it, Kiki Brain, let's go, man. Let's well, go. Same thing with Fleetwood Mac. You know, Peter Peter Green's version of, of Fleetwood Mac was very very different than what happened when uh, when Mick Fleetwood brings Lindsey Buckingham into the into the band. Totally changed. Totally yeah. changed. So of those, do you, do you prefer, like, for instance, let's go to Fleetwood Mac, because I would, I would actually say I prefer the Lindsey Buckingham version. Yeah, I would too. Versus, I would versus too. The, but but uh, Chicago, I prefer the earlier, the, the Terry Kath, uh, Robert Lamb version uh, more than when Peter said, who, Peter Cetera is a tremendously talented guy and wrote really great songs, but it was poppy and syrupy and not as enjoyable for me. Well, and that's the same thing, I think, Sticks and, and with Journey, I would say I like both of those bands in their earlier years. Yeah. Compared to like Styx's Mr. Roboto stuff. You Mr. Know? Roboto. Yeah. Domo origato, Mr. Yeah. Roboto. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. See, I speak 80s. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, I'm speaking 70s. So this is a coming together of our worlds. Well said. Well said. All right. So with that, uh, everybody, please hang on. We're going to have a bonus track right Woo-hoo! after this. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. Hi everyone, this is Tim with your bonus track for this episode. The key takeaways from our discussion with Dr. Bicchieri are, one, social norms are really bundled expectations. We have expectations about how people will behave and the collection of those expectations form what we call social norms. Dr. Bicchieri's work teaches us that changing social norms goes hand in hand with changing the way our expectations work. The second is that trendsetters influence the social norms. Trendsetters are people we acknowledge as influencers, and when they change their behaviors, we are likely to be influenced by them. Dr. Bicchieri referenced soap operas as having a very powerful but subtle effect on our behaviors, but this could also be seen more formally described as social media influencers like Kim Kardashian or pop stars like Kanye West and movie stars as Tom Hanks or Scarlett Johansson or political figures, including the President of the United States. The third is reference networks have a great impact on our worldview. 
More than just our neighbors, our family and our close friends influence our thoughts, feelings, and viewpoints with the way they talk about issues in our world. These reference networks are very powerful, and although the impact is largely subconscious, we are deeply influenced by what our reference networks believe. Okay, here is your groove idea for the week. Give some thought to the idea that reference networks have a huge effect on our behaviors. Who is in your reference network? Who among your friends and family says or does things that impact you either in a positive or a negative way? Jot down their names on a private piece of paper in your or in your journal and write down a few words about the ways that they influence you and make a conscious decision if that's the person that you want influencing you on that topic. Hope you have fun with it. As always, Kurt and I enjoy knowing that you are listening and we hope that you are making a difference. Well, in fact, we hope we're making a difference. We want to hear from you. So please reach out to us with your ideas, thoughts, and feedback and let us know what you think of the bonus track. And don't hesitate to give us a good rating or review. Behavioral Grooves ranking is in the lists that Apple and other podcast services share really help us get exposed to new listeners. So please help us get exposed to new listeners by sharing your thoughts online. Thanks very much. And keep on grooving. <laughs>